presented to us by Samuel Erb, a system software engineer from here in Cambridge. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm presenting this today because this is something that I'm really passionate about, and I really want to get see get deployed in the real world, um, get out of the realm of research papers and into the realm of protecting servers. Um, and I'll explain all that with this talk, hopefully. Um, the views expressed here are my own. They're not that of my employers, et cetera. Uh, so an outline of what I'm going to be talking about today, um, we talk about what is a crypto puzzle, um, just a brief introduction anyways, uh, what makes a good crypto puzzle, um, and then uh, we'll look at some examples, and finally a call to action. Uh, so definition, what is a crypto puzzle? Now before I do that, I want to just kind of get everyone on the same page. I want to talk about cryptographic hash functions. Um, if you don't know what this is, we're just looking for a function that's uh, impossible to invert. Um, it's going to be a one-way function, um, and it's going to have, in general, you're going to want to have these three properties. Uh, the first two are known as uh, 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 first and second pre-image resistance, and the third one's going to be known as collision resistance or um, uh, birthday uh, collision resistance, depending on uh, how you're talking about it. And uh, this is just from Wikipedia. Um, you'll notice that when there are small changes in the input text, it will result in a complete change of the output text, and uh, that's sometimes known as the um, avalanche effect. Um, so moving on. Uh, so crypto puzzles. This, came, this idea is actually came from the 1970s, so 40 years old at this point. Um, this was first uh, kind of, uh, I guess you say, introduced in 1974, actually, um, or thought of in 1974 by uh, Ralph Merkel who uh, wrote about this for an undergraduate project, actually. And uh, the idea is that you have um, some sort of uh, puzzle that's uh, uh, or cryptogram that's meant to be broken. Um, and there's going to be a set amount of effort, or a required amount of effort, in order to break it. And the only way to break it is through um, brute forcing, or trying every possible combination until you reach some um, uh, goal state. Um, and so, uh, just taking a bit of a aside first, uh, we can actually look at how uh, Merkel used crypto puzzles in this paper. Um, and so the idea is that uh, Bob will generate a large number of puzzles, as well as their solutions, and then send those over to Alice. Alice will solve one of those, and then send back some encrypted text using that solution. Bob knows what all the solutions are, can just try all of them, and see which one decrypts uh, what Alice sent over, and then they have encrypted communication. Now, this was 1974. This was two years before um, Diffie Hellman wrote their paper on um, public key crypto, and one year even before uh, the British government claimed to have invented it. Uh, so if we uh, look at, um, I should say, the paper that he actually wrote on this wasn't published in 1978, 1978, but it was based on his idea from 1974. Um, if we look at uh, an attacker's best attack on this, it's to simply spend as much time as Bob spent generating all those puzzles to uh, solve all of them. And uh, this disparity in the amount of work that Bob and Alice has to do was uh, arguably pretty revolutionary for the time. Um, and so Alice here gets to use less information, or sorry, less, ener or less energy uh, than an attacker or Bob, and uh, there's no pre-shared information uh, before this um, communication starts. Um, so, uh, defining crypto puzzles a little bit more formally, uh, we're going to look for a, um, uh, some uh, x value, which is going to be a message, uh, as well as a random nonce, uh, where uh, a hash of, um, a cryptographic hash of that x value is going to be equal to y, where y is going to be less than some difficulty q. And uh, we're going to say q can be adjusted to make a solution more or less difficult. And, uh, in general, the message can't be changed, so our only way to solve this is to guess what the random nonce value is. Uh, so we're going to try a bunch of these, and after a set number of guesses, odds are, the probability, you're going to find a solution. And um, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be uh, trying to identify what makes a good hash function here, and then we'll look at some examples. Uh, this is also um, sometimes referred to as a proof of work, which is one place you might have heard this, this heard this before uh, in relation to uh, Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. 
Um, there's also a, so looking at an example of where this gets used, uh, this was a um, uh, draft TLS extension uh, last year, that was published last year, and uh, it actually expired. Um, it wasn't accepted. Um, so it's not going to be deployed anywhere, but it's interesting in that uh, it can kind of show how this can work with something modern like SSL. Uh, so the server, uh, in this case, is going to pick some random value x, and the client is going to send over uh, an empty ex extension saying, hey, I support client puzzles. The server is then going to send back a, um, a hash of that x value, which we're going to say is equal to h, and then we're going to set the first um, n bits of that to zero and send that over as well where our difficulty in this case is going to be n. The client in this puzzle solution response is going to try and find some y value where a hash of that y value is uh, when, concat when combined with um, that uh, h prime that uh, the server sent over is equal to h. So it's looking to fill in those uh, empty bits or um, those n bits sent to, set to zero with, uh, uh, with the uh, output of a hash function, which in this case the, um, uh, is SHA-256. Uh, yeah. Um, and so you don't, the uh, client would also have to send over Y as well to prove that uh, they found it. Uh, looking at another example, uh, this is just a recent uh, Bitcoin block. Uh, so this is thinking in terms of a proof of work function. Uh, the, um, when we're talking about uh, Bitcoin mining, so to speak, it's going to be effectively just guessing a random nonce value here and trying to identify a hash value uh, with this number of zeros at the start of it, um, where that number of zeros is going to be the diff current uh, network difficulty uh, of the Bitcoin network. And uh, one of the what makes this kind of amazing is that uh, I actually did the, uh, looked up uh, how long it would take uh, my video card to calculate or to find a hash value with that many zeros at the start of it. And uh, it was on the order of 10,000 years, which is kind of crazy. Um, so uh, where does, uh, we have to ask, uh, where do client puzzles fit in today? Uh, we want to use them uh, as a way to protect servers. Uh, this really should not be the only way. Um, it should just be another tool in our toolbox. Uh, there's um, a bunch of other stuff we should do as well uh, to prevent ourselves from uh, uh, prevent the denial of service attack. But um, yeah, this is from a uh, just a survey of uh, new uh, attack method or new um, uh, detection and mitigation techniques. Um, so pretty much what I just said. Um, and it's been proposed in a few places. Uh, the draft I talked about earlier, as well as a new cryptographic protocol called uh, Minimalt. Um, not sure if I'm saying that correctly. Um, so it's an idea that gets floated very often, but uh, doesn't get implemented very often. All right, so now that we know what a uh, crypto puzzle is, uh, we're going to look and see what can make a good crypto puzzle. So um, in order to find that out, we have to figure out what our fixed resources are. So we're looking for some sort of fixed resource that we can have a client use roughly one second of in order to um, and prove that they used uh, you know, roughly a second uh, of their own resources in order to request some resource from our server, which is under attack. So we have an end user's time, which could be a CAPTCHA, for instance. Uh, and we could use their CPU resources, where um, you know, we're looking at um, uh, like SHA hashes per second. We have memory, where we can exploit uh, or utilize the client's uh, late memory latency or bandwidth. Uh, we have disk space. Um, one interesting thing here is that uh, proof of space is actually a thing. Um, I don't think it's a great thing, though, because uh, it's a pretty finite resource on a client, the number of, um, in terms of the number of writes that they can do. Um, so it might not be the best thing to use. And then we have uh, their uh, network bandwidth. 
which is going to be a finite resource for them, which we're trying to prevent a DOS anyway, so it kind of isn't great there. Um, and then we could also say that um, power could be a finite resource, but any of these are already wasting power anyways. Um, so just a quick comparison. Uh, so, sorry, going back to the previous slide. So for this, the remainder of this talk, I'm going to really focus on uh, wasting, uh, wasting the client's uh, CPU uh, and uh, memory resources, which is why the red arrows are there. So uh, comparing our, comparing, um, so I went ahead and uh, compared the uh, computational speed of my phone, uh, computer, and video card. Uh, my computer, in this case, was uh, eight times faster than my phone, and my video card was uh, 188 times faster than uh, my phone. And this is just calculating uh, SHA hashes. Um, uh, when I compare their memory bandwidth, um, and just in terms of gigabytes per second, um, my computer is only three times faster, and then my video card is only going to be uh, 25 times faster. But we have to have to look at uh, why that is. Um, and uh, I think we can get that number potentially even lower. Um, but uh, if one other good comparison here would be latency. And you would see uh, the phone and CPU being roughly the same. And then uh, the uh, GPU would probably be um, actually even, would likely have uh, less latency due to the technology involved, which I'll talk about on the next slide. So GPUs. Um, since we're uh, targeting uh, uh, end users' computer, um, about, uh, I think it was a, uh, one third of all uh, personal computers will have uh, dedicated uh, processing or dedicated uh, graphics cards on them. So um, uh, we have to uh, find some way to address that uh, such that uh, uh, we can, we're looking, so we're not looking to um, completely prevent somebody from using a graphics card to solve a client puzzle faster. We're just looking to make that uh, more equal with my phone, for instance. Um, and so one way to, uh, uh, so like an example approach we can use here is we can uh, uh, exploit memory latency, which is going to be uh, about twice as high on a video card than it is due to the, um, than it is on a computer or a phone, just simply due to the technology involved. Um, and yeah, a graphics card is literally just a massive parallel computer. Um, it's probably the best way to think about it. Um, so this is a bit of a busy slide. Um, so comparing uh, memory versus uh, CPU, once again, uh, or processor speed. Um, this is, if you've ever taken a computer architecture course, you've probably seen this image. It's going to be in the first chapter of kind of the classic computer architecture book. And I don't really feel like it tells the whole story of uh, processor versus memory speed. Um, in the past uh, decade, obviously, it shows that processor speed has stayed roughly the same. Uh, however, in that time, it's become more and more parallel, as well as uh, more complex instruction sets. Uh, whereas memory speed, um, for example, comparing uh, DDR1 and DDR4, you're only going to get like a, I think it's like a 10x speed up. Um, one other thing we have to look at is uh, the cost of all of this. Um, when we're talking about cost and crypto, uh, there's obviously going to be some point where we could just pay somebody to drive a uh, forklift through the data center or something. Um, but uh, if we're looking at uh, personal computers, somebody's going to be paying for, uh, when they buy a computer, they're going to buy a CPU and memory. So we're going to say those are roughly equal. Um, there's uh, something else we have to consider, though, is that uh, somebody could, if we, if we implemented this today, somebody could go ahead and implement or create a custom circuit for solving this. And uh, that's something that can't really be avoided, but we could drive up the economic cost for that. And that cost is kind of divided into two separate things, something called, um, so ASIC stands for uh, Application Specific Integrated Circuit. Uh, and so we're trying to drive up the cost of that. Uh, uh, NRE is going to be our um, uh, non-recurring engineering cost, which is going to be like the production cost. Uh, and we could say that interfacing with a 
uh, memory controller, uh, we're probably not going to design our own memory, so we're probably going to be interfacing with some existing memory, is going to be more expensive than, likely going to be more expensive than designing our circuit, but maybe not necessarily so. And uh, what's interesting is that somebody actually developed a cryptocurrency uh, around this, which required, I believe it was six separate uh, hash functions uh, in order to, um, and one of the benefits they claimed was that uh, production costs would be higher, uh, which is probably true. But when we look at production costs, when you're um, talking about uh, application-specific application uh, integrated circuits, the, um, uh, the amount of, uh, or the cost of any uh, board is going to be in terms of the size that it uses. And uh, I believe one of the numbers from a paper later uh, that I'll talk about called Argon says that uh, with one gigabyte of memory, you can fit uh, 10,000 Bitcoin hashing units in that same space. Um, so in this case, uh, you're also going to be have to have some sort of external supplier of memory. So your cost there will be significantly higher. Um, and it's what we're trying to avoid. This is on the right there is a Bitcoin warehouse or a warehouse that's dedicated to computing SHA hashes, which is kind of insane. <laughs> Uh, all right, so um, uh, so why sequentially memory hard? Um, if we have a sequentially memory hard hash function, uh, we have another parameter to affect difficulty. Um, this is something I didn't really touch on earlier as much, but uh, it's uh, beneficial. Um, the uh, discrepancy between memory technology on modern devices is a lot lower than CPU technology. Uh, and the cost uh, to design or produce custom hardware will be um, greater in algorithms requiring any variable amount of memory. Um, and so when we're talking about uh, sequentially, um, I have to mention that there's really two types of parallelization here. Um, there's parallelization that can occur within that hash function, and then there's parallelization that can occur by running uh, a series of these hash functions simultaneously, uh, trying to find a solution. Um, yeah. So uh, when we're, when I'm looking at uh, so later in the talk, I'm going to go over some examples, and I'm going to use um, a couple bars down here. This first bar is going to be memory required to find a solution uh, to avoid parallelization, and uh, that's actually green. It looks very green here. But um, on the low end here, I set that to be red uh, simply because uh, or bad simply because we want to avoid. Um, uh, any sort of parallelization, which you could get uh, by using less memory. On the high end, you're going to get unsupported devices as well as uh, less than one hash per second, which uh, if we're targeting one second, then that isn't, necessary, that isn't desirable. On the, um, so that's the memory required to find a solution. However, if we're having a server verify the solution, we don't want them to be using uh, a large amount of memory. So we're going to say that they're going to require pretty much no memory whatsoever. Uh, we don't want to create another uh, DOS vector. Uh, so this also isn't the first place to see these requirements. Um, this is a pretty good 2006 paper I'll talk about a little bit later, which uh, kind of outlines what makes a good memory-bound client puzzle, um, and these map directly to that. The reason why I really call these two out in particular is because they're, they seem to be the hardest to find right now. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll show that later. All right, so uh, using those bars, let's look at some examples. So first, um, let's look at uh, SHA-256, which I called out earlier. Uh, this is the government certified SCIR hash function. Um, on the right there is an example of an application-specific integrated circuit for solving um, SHA-256 hashes. Um, this is uh, just a, a picture from Wikipedia of the uh, kind of the internals of what that um, uh, SHA hash looks like, and while it requires no memory to find a solution, or, or while it requires no memory to verify the solution, it also requires no memory to find a solution, so it's not going to be ideal here. So uh, going back to that 2006 paper, um, it actually proposed a really interesting idea that doesn't really seem to get talked about anywhere else, um, but I could also not find a whole lot of downsides to it. 
Uh, and so it actually uses uh, an algorithm called uh, A star to solve uh, the sliding tile problem, or, yeah, which is over on the right side there. Um, if you've seen this before, uh, if you haven't seen this before, your goal is to slide the tiles around with, the op with using the open space to um, get some uh, end result, which in this case is going to be you know, one through eight. Um, and the most efficient way to solve this is actually to use a large amount of memory. And in some cases, if you don't use memory, it's actually going to be uh, thousands of times more difficult uh, to solve the problem. Um, the only real downside I could find, reading the paper anyways, was that uh, it does require a pre-computation on the server side uh, to uh, you know, avoid a, uh, a denial of server, another denial of service vector, but it doesn't require memory to actually solve it. You only need to, tra you only need to transfer the state, uh, state transitions. Uh, you don't need to transfer anything else um, that went into solving it. Um, yeah, one of the, I mean, from a personal standpoint, one of the more interesting downsides I can see here is that I wouldn't want to be the person implementing a star in OpenSSL, but that's just me. Uh, so uh, moving on, uh, this is a little bit more recent paper um, from uh, 2013, uh, uh, algorithm called Momentum. And the goal here is to find a birthday collision. Uh, this is violating one of the rules I talked about earlier. Um, so the birthday hash function here isn't a cryptographic hash function. Um, now, the idea here is that you generate a large table of these birthday hash values, trying to find a, uh, trying to find two that match up. Uh, the problem with this is that it is probably too easy to generate that table, and it's more or less sounds like an example of a MapReduce problem. Um, so hence the star down there in memory required to find, a, uh, to find memory required to find a solution. So um, this is kind of a bit more of a uh, expanded version of that called uh, Cuckoo Cycle, where um, we we have two groups of vertices and we try and find a path between them. And each edge is going to be a slightly, you'll notice the 2i and 2i plus 1 is going to be a slightly different uh, uh, hash function uh, to map between those such that it's memory hard in that you need to save, um, excuse me, you need to save uh, all the edges as you're going along building this uh, in order to try and identify a cycle. Uh, now, the downside with that is that somebody wrote a blog post on how it's possible to trim the graph, so to speak, while you're building it. Uh, you can uh, reject edges that aren't important. And uh, this is largely considered broken, unfortunately. But it's kind of an expansion of, uh, um, of momentum, one could say. And that's hence the start down there. Um, and I should say that vertices are generated by simply having uh, even numbers on the top, odd on the bottom. Um, yeah. All right, so uh, couldn't be talking about this unless I talked about the script. Uh, so this is a uh, key derivation function. It wasn't intended for use as a proof of work function. Um, its goal was to protect a password stored on a server. And uh, this is actually one of the better, um, if uh, you're interested in more of the economic side of this, it is actually one of the better um, arguments for a memory hard uh, hash function that exists right now um, in this paper as well as in his presentation on this paper. Um, so the idea here is that you, uh, you take a hash, you um, do a bunch of um, lookups uh, in a pool of memory uh, based on previous lookups in that pool of memory. And you then take a hash of uh, the final uh, block you get, and uh, you get your result. So it looks like a hash function on both ends, but uh, in the middle it requires a huge amount of memory. Um, and this is actually does get used as a proof of work function. It turns out in uh, alternative cryptocurrencies, uh, Litecoin and Vercoin. And um, in this case, this wouldn't be ideal to use because uh, it requires the same amount of memory to verify that it does define the solution. If it required less memory to verify a solution, then it wouldn't be a good uh, password key derivation function. Um, so a bit more of a, this is a bit of an expanded version of that, I could say. Um, this was a, this is more recent um, 
paper from 2014. Uh, script was from 2009. Uh, this is, a, a, I guess I could say, a bit more of a complicated version. Uh, it claims to be more memory hard in that more, uh, it would require more computing power if less memory is used to actually create the hash. Um, the interesting thing here, uh, and the reason why I included this, is that it included something called, uh, the paper detailed something called gradual verification, where in one of these for loops, you stop it early and you send a, the output with the T cut off um, out early to the server, um, which requires the same amount of memory, but less uh, operations on that memory in order to verify the solution. Because uh, you can verify it, uh, you know, you, you cut this off, you know, once every um, a, a number of steps and send that over. Um, so this brings me to what I'm really excited about. This is something called Argon2, and this paper actually came out this week. Uh, this, which makes this talk perfectly timed, um, this was part of the, uh, Argon2 was published as part of the uh, um, password hashing competition, which is a competition that's going on right now in order to find a um, more ideal password key derivation function. But then they went ahead this week and published a paper on how Argon2 could be used, uh, it turns out, in a cryptocurrency, but also here um, in order to uh, create a, a really solid uh, proof of work function. You notice that it has a similar construction to script or uh, the RAND memo hash I talked about previously, in that you take a hash, it does something complicated with the memory, and then you take a hash again of the output. Um, but uh, the um, really interesting idea here, which could probably be used for script and RAND memo hash, which I talked about previously, is that uh, it actually proposed a, a verification scheme where uh, you use a uh, Merkle tree to um, uh, verify the solution. So the memory card defined solution you know, can be very high. In this case, I believe the paper said two gigabytes. And you can verify that using only, um, they said, uh, about two megabytes of memory, which is very impressive. Um, for those of you who don't know what a Merkle tree is, you're going to have two leaves. And then the parent of those two leaves is going to be a hash of them. And across the bottom of that tree, you're going to put uh, these blocks here. Uh, from 1 to t, and uh, going up the tree until you get to some root node. Uh, so when you're trying to verify this, you're going to, um, the scheme they propose, I believe you're going to ask the uh, client for uh, random root nodes, and then all the hashes going up along the edges that are going to uh, allow you to rederive the uh, root node, but without transferring every single uh, block across. Um, this is a really promising idea, and it fits uh, like pretty much everything that I'm looking for in a um, crypto puzzle. Um, I really think it's going to go places. Uh, but yeah, it just got published this week. And if you only read, if you're interested in this topic and you only read one paper coming out of this talk, I really, really recommend that paper. Um, it does a great job of uh, explaining this uh, field and then uh, reaching a conclusion and coming to a a uh, really solid uh, proof of work function. All right, and so finally, uh, call to action. Um, so this is my original call to action was uh, get out there and find a sequentially memory art hash function. I'm a software guy. I'm not a cryptologist. I don't claim to be. Um, it, but you know, now that we have Argon2, is that going to be good enough? Is that going to hold up? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I hope it will. Um, and then the other question is, should we, you know, Argon2 came out of a password hashing competition, which wasn't for proof of work functions or uh, uh, crypto puzzles. Could there be a password hashing competition here? Um, I would hope so. But, um, you know, obviously that would be very interest-based. Interest um, so, thank you. Uh, any questions? <coughs> It's not immediately clear to me um, what the difference is between crypto puzzles as a general concept and all the password cracking, uh, cracking work that's, you know, that's been going on for a long time. Can you expand on that a little bit? Or are they really more or less equivalent? 
Um, it's going to be generally pretty equivalent. Uh, like I was saying earlier, when you're talking about a um, password key derivation function, you don't want that shortcut to verify a solution. Whereas with a uh, crypto puzzle or a proof of work function, it's advantageous to have that shortcut to verify a solution, not necessarily reach a solution in the first place. Um, and the, uh, I'll save my question for later. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Right. All right. So it's on minutes later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things that I think is interesting about you know the, the password hash problem, at least classically, was the notion of using rainbow tables. Yep. And you talk about like the sliding tile puzzle. Yep. Are there rainbow table cracks that are roughly equivalent in the crypto puzzle arena as well? I think so. Um, the paper outlines a way to avoid that, I believe. That's something I'm really not an expert on at all. Um, it claims that there is a way to um, avoid that and that it actually might be advantageous to uh, uh, have a client create a rainbow table. Um, because once again, that's a memory requirement. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the details of that all that well. Uh, are there any other questions? All right. Well, um, thank you. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can tweet at me or send me an email. Uh, I hope I didn't bore you today. Just a reminder as we go into closing remarks, uh, evaluation forms, if you fill one out, you enter to win for